e rere taku manu ko taa, ko pāngi e tā au taku rua, e a pai te karere o te papakainga, te rongo o taku tīputa, me kura te rangi i te ai ai, ka maara au i a koe. E te mana whenua, te atiawa, kai te mihi kātika, kai te tautoko katoa e ngā mihi kua mihia, tēnā koutou katoa, rātou ki a rātou, rātou anō ki o i keo tautahi, i oki oki ana i tēnei wā, tātou ki a tātou e kara pene pene ana, ki rano te whakaruruhau o tēnei au nā whare, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Koe tēnei e tuake nei, ko Ngāpuhi, ko Ngaitako tō Ngāiwi, ko te uriroro i te hapu, ko tō mātou awa, ko te waipao, ko whatatiri te maunga. Ki te taho o taku pāpā no te pāene o te koki aerani, no te oire o areora, ko Ngāti Ingatū, ko Ngāti Toki, me ona pānga ki a Ngāti Pairangi, Ngā Iwi. Nō reira, kia ora nga koutou katoa tō te aroa rā nui nui o te atua. Mr. Speaker, Atu Tumu and the Taitokero are in the house today. And I have been thinking about the places that have defined me to get me at this, to this place. And uh, two of those places are Manurera and Palmerston North. <laughs> to coin two phrases at once, Mr. Speaker, I'm Palmy Proud and Reba Hard. <laughs> and I would like to give a shout out to everyone who is connected to, to both of those great two places. So to everyone who has rolled in from Palmy and the, and the Rewa and everywhere else in between, to my campaign team from Palmerston North and also the Greens wider Fano, who have put in all the hard years after a very, very long campaign. Tēnā koutou katoa. I thank you all for your effort. I also acknowledge Tangi Utakere, the MP for Palmerston North, and note that two-thirds of the Cook Islands Parliamentary Caucus comes from Palmerston North. <laughs> Uh, I actually asked a cousin of mine recently if that qualifies Palmy to be the 16th island of the Cook Islands, and he said, no, that's Tokoro. <laughs> I said, how about 17 or 18? And he said, no, that's probably Puriroa or Otara. <laughs> and also, the Cook Islands already has an island called Palmerston, which means you would end up being called South Palmerston North South, which would probably break Google Maps. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I am both Tangata Whenua and Tangata Moana, a descendant of both the land and sea like the tide ebbing and flowing into, onto the shore that doesn't know where the land begins and the sea ends, me, moving between these two communities is seamless for many of us who have this shared whakapapa. This connection always reminds me of a saying by poet and intellectual Teresia Teewa, who said, we sweat and cry salt water so that we know that the ocean is really in our blood. It reminds me that before there were borders and lines that carved up the Pacific, that Whakapapa connected these islands, and that there is a deeper and richer tapestry of history that has been woven over centuries of interaction. Interactions that cannot be confined by borders, but share linguistic, ancestral and cultural roots from Aotearoa to Hawaii, over to Rapa Nui, and with connections with every island in between. So often, so, so, some people often ask me if I'm half Māori or half Pacifica, and I'm always like, nah, bro. <laughs> I'm not half anything. I'm whole, and I don't think anyone is half anything. If anything, I'm double. <laughs> if I was a beer, I would be double brown. <laughs> if I was a flavour down at the dairy, I'd be twice as nice, but at only half the price. <laughs> I am two peas in the cultural pod. Growing up Māori and Pacifica means growing up biculturally and having neither of those as the dominant culture, which meant I had to go to school to learn about Pākehā, and to be honest, I'm still learning about you people. <laughs> Uh, this is not a story unique to myself, but it is part of the story of places like South Auckland, Porirua, Aranui, Highbury, anywhere where our peoples have put down roots. My parents met in the tradition of that, of that story. And what I mean by that is they met at the pub where my, where my dad was the bouncer and my mum was trying to get in. <laughs> uh, my parents went the richest, but we were rich in the things that matter, love. We would sometimes work in the school holidays helping my dad mow lawns for a living, but I never went without. Education was really important to my parents. I remember once when my dad, my dad saying to me, hey boy, you want this encyclopedia set? And I remember saying to him, uh, no thanks. And just like magic, I owned an encyclopedia set. <laughs> my father was born in Areora on the island of Atu, Enua Manu, also known as the land of birds and us, and I acknowledge all the Atuans here today. We are from Ngāti Ingatū and Ngāti Tuki with connections to Ngāti Pairangi. 
It is from my grandfather, Papa Tiriki Tuyono, that I inherit my commitment to my communities. And today I acknowledge my aunties, Auntie Teo and Auntie Apaida, who are here today. And although I join a growing number of MPs who think we should have the option of pledging to the Tiriti of Waitangi as opposed to the Queen, I know, the, I know that the old man wouldn't have minded because he got a, he got a medal from her. A QSM for services to community. Back in the day, I would spend time at his place in Ōtara discussing left-wing politics and about the olden days back in the islands. Like when he was 14, working on the Makatea just over the border in French Polynesia, where young Archuans had gone to mine phosphate. His commitment to community and through that, the workers continued, continued when he migrated to Aotearoa. And I think my colleagues in the Labour Party would have liked him. He was a member of their party. He would often give me helpful advice, which also sounded uh, a bit mandatory, if not compulsory. Uh, like the time he said to me, you know what, boy, you talk a lot. You should be a minister at the PIC church or a lawyer. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that is the story of how I got a law degree. <laughs> uh, my father was about the same age as I am now when he passed away in 1996. He worked too many jobs for too many hours. My grandfather passed away in the year 2000 and my grandmother passed last, just last year. They leave me with enduring lessons that I will carry into this house. Over the many years, I have been inspired politically by many people, but way before I had ever heard of Angela Davis, Emma Goldman, Eva Rickard, Fannin, Chomsky or Marx, my first political role model was my mum. People often say that I'm my mother's son, which is very accurate because she was there when I was born. One of my earliest memories is my mum explaining to me about the Māori land march in our lounge. My mum also took me on my first protest in 1981 against the Springbok tour when I was in primary school. I remember marching down Queen Street with the multitudes chanting, Amandla, Amandla, Amandla. When she was a cleaner, she organised pickets and the workers. And when I was in my late teens, she dropped me and my brother off at the marae and told us to learn Māori, which we did. My mother has never shown any advice, even if you don't want it. <laughs> hey, Mum. Uh, but there is always that reminder. She would always say to me, remember you're from the north, boy. She actually said that to me last week. <laughs> so yes, it is northern blood that flows through these veins. And to all the other northerners in this house, and I think we are in all the parties, I say, kia ora kazis. <laughs> I look forward to agreeing to agree, agreeing to disagree, and because this is Parliament and anything could happen, disagreeing to disagree. <laughs> uh, my mother's father is from the Te Ruroi in Poroti, where the watercress is fresh and the vibrance and intellectual rigour of my people is fresher. Yes. It is through Te Owai that we, we are connected to people across the Taitokero. My, grand, my grandmother is from Ngai Takoto. Our marae there is Paparore. You have to drive past Awanui. And if you don't drive fast enough, you'll be pulled like a tractor beam into Hone Harawira's house for a cup of tea because you've got to go past this house to get there. I referenced Whatateri earlier as one of my manga. Whatateri is the word for thunder. And the reason it is called Thunder Mountain was because the kukupa and kereru were so abundant when then they collectively flapped their wings, it was like thunder. Now it is silent up there. All the trees have been chopped down, environmental devastation. This silence is what happens when we do not remember our history, when we view events as isolated occasions and not part of the wider arc of colonisation. This dispossession of Indigenous peoples correlates directly with the environmental destruction of those lands. And I stand and continue to stand with Indigenous brothers and sisters from the Arctic to the Amazon to Australia across Turtle Island as we push back against extractive industries and against the destruction of this planet. Climate change is an outcome of colonisations which has removed indigenous communities' ability to defend the land and the water. And here, in the Pacific, our island homes are on the front lines of climate change. The struggle to protect the environment is also the struggle for self-determination. That struggle here is the struggle for Tinoranga Tiratanga. For me, Tinoranga Tiratanga could be a radically democratic alternative to capitalism which the flax roots local communities would be constantly and actively involved in making the decisions about the allocation of society's resources in a collective way. It should embrace a system which our entire economy is geared up to satisfy the needs of whānau, our tikanga, cultural values and aspirations, not the profit margins of a tiny elite. 
It would encapsulate our role as kaitiaki, guardians of the earth and ecosystems. It would be based on a vision of society that affirms mana wahine, that is free of racism, class exploitation, and embraces our rainbow whānau. I have always worked at the intersection of movements, and I believe that it is in solidarity that each with each other that we are stronger. I see our work here in Parliament as Greens as part of the wider Green movement, in which when woven together with other movements like a kete, can hold together our collective aspirations. I will also remember to turn my face to the streets. I acknowledge all of the activists, past, present and yet to come, who have and will put body and soul on the line for social and environmental justice, tēnā koutou. One thing I have learnt, though, through the years is that although ideas and ideology don't change, people do. People either change or sometimes are not what you expect. Soldiers who oppose war, dairy farmers who are opposed to intensive dairy farming, devout Christians opposed to Islamophobia. I have learnt over many years to expect the unexpected, that common ground can exist if we are open to finding it. And I wonder, perhaps, if there are unexpected friends and allies in this place. If there was ever a time in which we need, for we need to reach for alternatives, it is now. The planet is heating up. Every year is hotter than the year before it. We started this year with the Australian bushfires, fires so hot that they even stained the skies here. We are facing ecological collapse and the mass extinction of species, and all of this layered with the COVID crisis and deepening poverty. The powers that hold this place, hold this power in place seem inevitable, but I am reminded of the words of the writer Ursula Le Guin when she said, we live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in the arts. Artists help us to dream about what could be and what might be and help us to consider unexpected perspectives. I want to acknowledge all the poets, the writers, the dancers, the visual artists, carvers, singers and composers, and those who defy definition by the very of nature of who they are. I know this personally about us could artist because I married one. Moreira e te tau o taku ate, taku toka tūmoana, tēnei te mihi kia koe. Terry, thank you for your strength and wisdom, for being the calm and the storm, and the storm and the calm when needed. Thank you for always supporting my political adventures and also my political misadventures. I'm still figuring out whether which of those two this is yet. Thank you especially for helping me to view the world in different and unique ways. That is the gift that artists everywhere give to us all. If there is a time that we need to reimagine the world, it is now. That reimagination must challenge the way things are to look back beyond the systems that hold power in place. Science fiction has always been a medium for futuristic imagination, and no surprises, I'm a bit of a fan. And possibly this is the reason why I was given the science research and innovation portfolio, because they probably figured, well, he's good with science fiction, that's how he deals with science facts. <laughs> I was reflecting on this as I stepped into the inner core of the beehive where the lifts are, and I want all members to listen very carefully because I want these words to follow you whenever you step in there, and that's this. It looks like the TARDIS. <laughs> it, looks, it looks and feels dimensionally outside of space and time, but here's the thing. A TARDIS is much bigger on the inside than they are on the outside, and that is what this place needs to be. Our ideas need to be bigger than this place, much bigger. We cannot go back to the way that things are. That world is disappearing fast, and it is our role to ensure a future for our tamariki and mukapuna. As Arundhati Roy said, another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Nō reira, e te whare, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, huri nō te ruma, tēnā tātou katoa.
Короче. I call Tracy McLellan for her maiden speech.